So good evening, everyone. As I said before, my name is Matt Kaseki, and I am the Community Outreach and Education Coordinator with NAMI Greater Cleveland. Um, I am happy to be with you this evening for this important topic, Partners in Care, Understanding Legal, Gu legal Guardianship. Um, we're very happy to have folks from the Cuyahoga County Probate Court with us to speak on this topic. Um, I'm just going to speak very briefly about NAMI Greater Cleveland, who we are and what we do, um, and also just offer a few housekeeping notes for your participation in our program this evening. Um, we do have a decent number of people in the meeting tonight, so please make sure you are muted. And also, if you have any questions, please utilize the chat feature. Um, we will answer as many questions as we can this evening. We'll have some time at the end for questions, but also um, if you ask a question in the chat that is pertaining to the information that is on the current slide as our presenter is sharing, um, I will, um, when I can, um, interject with your question so that we can address it promptly. Um, and yeah, since it is being recorded, just be mindful of that if you don't want to be seen. Um, and this webinar will be posted to the NAMI Greater Cleveland YouTube channel later this week. And I will also be sharing the slides with um, those of you that attended later as well. Um, and we'll be sharing a document with you that is um, relevant to the presentation as well. I will put that in the chat when it um, becomes appropriate. Um, so just very briefly about NAMI Greater Cleveland. Um, we are the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, we are the local affiliate that serves Cuyahoga County. NAMI is a grassroots organization that was founded in 1979 in Wisconsin by a group of mothers of children with mental illness, specifically schizophrenia. And they um, formed this grassroots coalition of NAMI around their kitchen tables because they were really um, seeing the lack of support and education in their local communities around the reality of living with mental illness. NAMI is now represented by state and local affiliates in all 50 states and is the largest grassroots mental health organization of its kind. Uh, the NAMI Greater Cleveland mission is dedicated to empowering those living with mental illness and their families to achieve a better quality of life by providing education, support, information and referral and advocacy. Um, so some of the things that we offer that you may be aware of or not are our support groups, some are for people with mental illness, some are for families. Um, we do community education um, with groups like law enforcement, college students, middle school and high school students and families. We have eight week educational courses for people with mental illness called peer to peer, as well as an eight week course for families called family to family. We have a helpline that's available Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, that may be a resource that you may want to take advantage of if you have questions beyond the scope of tonight's conversation about guardianship for your loved one. Um, and I can put the number for the helpline in the chat at a later time. Um, and we also support advocacy in the sense of raising awareness about mental illness, um, reducing the stigma around mental illness, um, supporting national and state level um, uh, legislative advocacy to support more funding for mental health, more humane treatment options, and so on. Um, so that's NAMI Greater Cleveland in a nutshell. Uh, I am happy to turn the presentation over to Magistrate David Mills and Jude Troja, who are with the Cuyahoga County Probate Court, and they will be guiding us through the next hour for this presentation. So at this time, I will hand it over to um, David and Jude. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Magistrate Mills? Can you hear me? Magistrate he's Mills? Here. Yeah, he's here. I need to, he needs to unmute. Okay. Oh, he just left. I'm sorry. He left the meeting. Here he is. He's back. Okay. Uh, Magistrate Mills, can you hear us? Can you speak? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, maybe Jude, do you want to just start with the presentation then? Okay, well, while we're waiting for the magistrate, he, there, there's a... Um, 
a couple of slides we're going to start with, but the magistrate wanted to talk about them specifically. While we're waiting for him, my name's Jude Troja. I am one of the investigators, the guardianship investigators for the probate court of Cuyahoga County. Thank you for, um, you know, for giving us the opportunity to talk about guardianship tonight. I've been doing this work for many years. I think it's good work. I think it's very important. Um, I talked to Matt before we started this evening and he had sent me a list of questions that are likely to be brought up tonight. I tried to, to build those questions into this presentation and I hope that at least some of your questions will be answered before we're done tonight. You're certainly welcome to contact the court if there's more information that you need, we're happy to talk to you. We are here to serve people and we're here to support you in your um, efforts to get help for your loved ones. So we're gonna start with what is guardianship? And this is um, kind of a stiff definition, but guardianship is an involuntary trust relationship in which one party, the guardian, acts for a person under guardianship, and the person under guardianship is called the ward. The law regards the ward as incapable of managing his or her own person or affairs. So that's kind of the dry technical definition. What guardians are, guardians are advocates and decision makers, and they speak for people who have no voice. I've been with the court for a little over three years. Before that, I worked for quite a few years for the Guardianship Services Program. It is a program that's operated by Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. And what that program does is it provides guardians for indigent adults in Cuyahoga County. So I did that for, for quite a few years. I was guardian for quite a few people with mental illness. Um, I think I have some sensitivity with uh, what you are trying to accomplish for your loved ones. And I hope that comes across in tonight's presentation. But truly you are, as, as guardians or potential guardians, you are get advocates for your loved ones and you are decision makers for them. This is, um, Guardianship is, as far as people speaking on their own behalf, guardianship is when your, your legal voice is essentially taken away from you. This is a list of, of uh, legal alternatives which affect adult decision-making. And it goes from voluntary to involuntary. At the top of the list is a will. I think that most people here know what a will is. You uh, create a document that says what you wanna have happen to your resources when you pass away. Power of attorney, people talk about POAs a lot. There's basically two kinds. There's a general power of attorney, which is usually associated with finances. There's a healthcare power of attorney. A power of attorney is a voluntary relationship between two people. I would agree to be Matt's POA if he asked me and he wants me to do that. So we, we both agree to do it, but it, it's a totally voluntary relationship between two people. There's no oversight by the court. The guardianship, the, I'm sorry, the POA can be terminated at any time. Uh, the, the POA document can be recorded on the county level, but that doesn't affect the, its, um, its legitimacy. It doesn't have to be recorded. Some people choose to do it. A medical advance directive is where you outline what you want to have happen to you in case you can't speak for yourself. Do you or don't you want to have um, a feeding tube? do you or don't you want to have mechanical ventilation? So that's a document that you create and you, you express those wishes. You will have a agent who will speak on your behalf. And if the document is properly executed, a medical provider is, is obligated to honor your wishes as stated. Ohio law also permits a psychiatric advance directive. It's not very common, it's very cumbersome but uh, there is a mechanism in place for you to direct your, your mental health care if you have a major mental illness and you um, decompensate as a result of that. Conservatorship is done through probate court. And what that basically is, it is a, think of it as a power of attorney for finances with uh, court oversight. So you, if you are, physically infirm, but cognitively intact, you can create a conservatorship document and appoint somebody to manage your finances for you. 
It does have to be approved by the court and there are reporting requirements, but again, it, it is a voluntary relationship with court oversight. Uh, moving down, adult protective services is mandated by the state to investigate uh, allegations of abuse, neglect, or exploitation for people who are 60 and older. They could be suffering from dementia, they could be suffering from mental illness. If you pick up an APS case and they think that you need treatment, they will get an order through probate court, which is called a protective services order. You can be hospitalized and possibly placed in a nursing home against your will. So that's where your, uh, the loss of your rights starts to come into play right now. People often talk about probating somebody who's mentally ill. That, that's a, um, like a, a, just a street expression for what, what is known as an order of detention, which is issued through probate court. And what that is, is if you have a mental illness, because of that illness, which is presumably untreated, you are a danger to yourself or others. You can get an order through probate court to have your loved one taken to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. Uh, the big misunderstanding with this for a lot of people is when somebody is probated, when they're taken to the hospital for an evaluation, it is not in order for them to be admitted to the hospital. It's in order for, for the person to be evaluated by a psychiatrist. If the psychiatrist thinks that the person needs to be admitted, they can be admitted against their will. But if the psychiatrist feels that the, the person does not meet the criteria for hospitalization, uh, meet the criteria for hospitalization, uh, meet the criteria for hospitalization, Hello, magistrate. Sorry about, that. Sorry about that. There was an echo. Okay. Can you get magistrate Mills? Can you get his attention? Uh, magistrate Mills, if you are here and able to participate, please unmute. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hear you. Okay. I, I had to switch laptops. I wasn't. I still don't have a camera on. Oh, here we go. Start video. Okay. I had to switch laptops there. The work laptop wasn't working. I'm on my personal one now. I don't know what the headache is. Okay, go ahead, Jude. I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, okay, did you hear what I was saying? Yes, I, I was following some of it as I was working here. Um, you you were uh, oh you were going through the the power of attorney wills and so forth. Yeah, correct? The, the, the alternatives. So I just got done talking about probating somebody. Next up is uh, Casey's law. Yeah, let me let me just uh, throw something in here with regard to the uh, uh, power of attorney and uh, advanced medical directives and 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 things like that. Yes. Um, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here in guardianship law, but uh, you know, um, in order to establish a guardianship, there's three criteria that need to be met. Number one, there needs to be clear and convincing evidence that the individual is impaired. And that we rely on, obviously on the statement of expert evaluation that we'll be going over later, for the most part. Um, the, uh, give me one second. The uh, second. Okay. The second uh, thing we look at is, um, uh, is the applicant suitable? Family member, attorney, social worker, whoever it is, are they suitable to serve as guardian? That, that uh, is part of the investigation and um, uh, a part of what we cover at the hearing. And the third prong, and this is where the power of attorney and the advanced directives come in, is there a less restrictive alternative? That's what the statute asks. And for example, a power of attorney for finances or for a um, uh, for a mental health could be a a, uh, um, a less restrictive alternative to guardianship. Um, a headache with powers of attorney, of course, 
um, um, number one, they could be terminated by the ward or by the individual, which would render it ineffective. And uh, it really doesn't have the broad range of powers that guardianship would have. You have the authority, for example, to make medical decisions, but not necessarily uh, to deal with issues like housing and, and other personal care type issues. I don't think a power of attorney would really cover that. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Jude. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, uh, heading towards um, losing your, your rights, there's, there is a, a law called Casey's Law, and that permits an involuntary treatment for alcohol and other drug abuse. It is used rarely. It's, it's a clunky law. There is a lot of financial responsibility that has to be assumed by whoever wants to um, get their loved one into treatment. And it just, it, it's there, but it's not, it's not all that helpful. Uh, there is a program that our court has now. It is called Assistant Outpatient Treatment. And through probate court, a person can be ordered to get mental health treatment in the community. That's, um, again, that's something that somebody, if, if the court thinks that it's necessary, we can, we can make that happen. Uh, and that's, we, we certainly want the people involved in treatment, but if the court thinks it's necessary, then it will be done, which leads to guardianship. If, if okay. I can just say something real quick about the AOT program, assisted outpatient treatment. Um, it, it's sort of our alternative to, you know, in a criminal case, uh, which they certainly are a criminal case, but in a criminal case, uh, when someone's released from jail, they're on probation and there's a period of monitoring by the probation department, by the court. And that's what AOT is about. Rather than having somebody hospitalized for months and months, maybe we can get them back in the community with monitoring. Uh, they report to the court about every two weeks with their social worker to review their progress. And the goal is to at some point get them released from AOT. Uh, but the sort of the benefit you know, the way, way the probation part of it works, um, if, if, if they do relapse, if they become non compliant with medication, things like that, we can pretty quickly and easily get them back into the hospital if they're on our AOT program. We don't have to start over again. Okay. okay. Incompetence versus impairment. People under guardianship have been found to be incompetent. This is a legal determination. It is not a medical determination. Guardianship is based on medical evidence which provides proof of a mental impairment. And that impairment could take uh, any one of a number of, of causes. You can, you can be mentally impaired as a result of mental illness. You can be mentally impaired as a result of dementia, a traumatic brain injury, advanced, one of the advanced neuromuscular diseases, Huntington's, Parkinson's, um, chronic substance abuse is a qualifying diagnosis for guardianship. But uh, the idea behind it, the premises is that the medical evidence documents a lack of capacity. And there's, there's a number of definitions for capacity. This, the, this one I like, I think it, it, it's pretty concise. It's a capacity is the ability to understand and appreciate the nature and consequences of a decision and reach and inform and communicate an informed decision on the matter at hand. And one thing I think is really important to, to emphasize is that impairment, a cognitive impairment is not necessarily global. Some people could make like really good decisions in one, one area of their life, say housing, um, or finances, but but they can make good decisions in others, and in many instances, that decision will revolve around medication or, or the lack of medication because people with mental illness often don't think there's anything wrong. So why take medicine if there's nothing wrong with you? But the impairment is not always global. Uh, and I think this is one of the key reasons why everybody is here tonight should I become my loved one's guardian? Maybe you should. 
Maybe you shouldn't. It's, uh, again, I've been guardian for many people over the years who, who had a chronic mental illness. And sometimes you can help them and sometimes you can't. It's really as simple as that. There's no way, there's no guarantee that guardianship is gonna be effective. You're not gonna know walking into a guardianship whether it's gonna be helpful or not, but it might be. The problem is, is that there is a lot of legal authority that you're given as a guardian, but it's difficult to implement that authority. And there's um, common scenarios that we're gonna talk about now as far as what, what authority you have and then what roadblocks there are to using that authority. I think the big one for, for probably for a lot of people who are here this evening is medication. Medication works, that's why people uh, should be taking it. So as guardian, you have the authority to authorize psychiatric treatment, which includes the prescribing of psych meds, but you can't, you can't make your loved one swallow the pills. It's as simple as that. The, the, you, you have the authority to, to authorize the medication, but if you say you have to take because I'm the guardian, they might just laugh at you and you're really powerless at that point. Some medications can be given intramuscularly. You can get an injection and um, that's good. It's a long lasting, medi long lasting medication. It can last for two weeks or four weeks. But by the same token, if your loved one refuses the medication, you can't, you can't give it to them yourself. And it's really dangerous if somebody is not willing to receive an injection, the, the only safe way for that to take place is in a hospital setting. And that's not something that will be scheduled on a routine basis for somebody who's in the community. So yeah, medication works. Medication works very well, but even though you can authorize it, you can't compel somebody to take it. So that's, that's a real problem. Uh, medical care, either inpatient or outpatient, that's um, kind of follows along with medication. You can arrange the treatment, but you can't compel it. You can schedule an, an appointment for somebody to go see a PCP or to see a psychiatrist. You can take them to the appointment. You can walk them into the, the um, exam room with them. You can't necessarily make them participate. Uh, one thing uh, that I would like to say here is, is that a lot of providers, if they know that there's a guardianship, they expect the guardian to be in the exam room with, with their loved one. So that's something to keep in mind. But again, you can't really get them to engage necessarily against their will. Sometimes people wind up in the hospital, a, a surgery might become necessary or some type of invasive procedure. You can give the consent to that, um, but I, I have had experiences over the years where if somebody, if a procedure is presented to somebody and they don't consent to it, the surgeon won't do that procedure even if you give consent as the guardian. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. If, if I can chime in on that, because we, we have a lot, lot of contact with hospitals on, on, on this issue, on both of the issues raised on this slide. And the hospitals in our community are wildly inconsistent in how they deal with that, especially with regard to an invasive procedure, surgery, or something like that as necessary. Uh, many will pr proceed based on the consent of the guardian. A few others will not. I mean, we've had hospitals actually come to us asking to establish guardianships just so a guardian can consent to unnecessary but invasive uh, medical procedure, um, you know, so, so there's just a lot of inconsistency on that issue. Okay. One thing that, that um, is important to, uh, as far as medical issues, as opposed to psychiatric, some people who have a mental illness, in addition to not believing that they have a mental illness, will deny that there is anything wrong with them physically. I've um, known people with schizophrenia who have gotten definitive diagnoses of cancer and they have refused to get cancer treatment because they don't believe that they have it, despite all evidence to the contrary, which is uh, not only frustrating, but it's heartbreaking. So if they don't think that they have cancer, why would they go through chemo or radiation or any treatment? 
Okay, next slide. Inpatient psychiatric care. This, uh, you know, if, if your loved one needs to be admitted to the hospital, they might agree to treatment and that's fine. At, the, and at that point, all you do is, is sign the admission paperwork, uh, the voluntary, which agrees for them to receive psychiatric treatment. Uh, if they don't agree to go to the hospital, if they need to go, then this would go back to getting an order of detention or a probate order again through probate court. Uh, again, the issuance criteria, the person has a mental illness. Because of that illness, they're a danger to themselves or others. We issue an order for the police to take them to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. The police take them because it's the only safe way that we as a society have figured out is to get somebody there safely. It is not a crime, they're not under arrest, but the police will take them to the hospital. When somebody's probated in, in our county, the generally speaking, the hospital of um, the first hospital will be the um, St. Vincent's Charity. They have a psychiatric emergency room. They have a contract with the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County to assess people who, who um, are probated. And most people who, who are issued a probate order will wind up at, at St. Vincent's at the psychiatric emergency department. The other hospitals in the county that have psychiatric units, we can send people there. If people ask if their loved one can be sent to Lutheran, we have to call ahead of time and get permission. These days, it's um, very difficult to get a bed at any hospital between COVID and, and a lot of people needing to be hospitalized. There, there's um, a chronic shortage of psychiatric beds, so it's difficult to get somebody into any of the private hospitals apart from St. Vincent's. They, St. Vincent's has to take anybody that gets sent there. You know, a question uh, you folks might ask is, well, why should I do guardianship if I've got to go through this psychiatric uh, intake uh, process anyways? But there's a huge advantage uh, to having a guardianship. Um, the only purpose of this detention order, as Jude says, to get the individual safely to where they need to be, to psychiatric hospital most likely. Um, but once they're there, if there's a guardian in place, the admission becomes a voluntary admission, not an involuntary admission, which is really critical because in an involuntary admission, the only person that has any control over what happens is the treating doctor. I mean, all, often within 24 hours, they declare the individual, you know, to be stable and they release them, you know or it goes through a whole court process, whereas none of that is necessary if we have a guardian in place. Am I correct, Jude? If there's a guardian in place, the psychiatric case can then be terminated once they're admitted, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's a huge advantage to having a guardianship, even though you may have to use the psychiatric uh, department process to get the individual to the hospital. Okay. okay. We're gonna talk about housing for a minute. People with mental illness often benefit See, from so I'm sorry. Yes, it was Hello? just an accident. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, so, uh, some people with mental illness will benefit from living in, in some type of congregate setting. It could be a group home, a residential care facility, assisted living. Um, sometimes they have to uh, live in a nursing home, but um, Again, with as with medical treatment or medication, you can arrange housing for somebody, but as far as actually moving them from from home or from a homeless shelter into into housing, you have the authority, but it's difficult to get somebody from point A to point B if they don't want to leave. We've um, I've known people who have literally lived in the uh, the men's shelter at twenty one hundred Lakeside for a couple of years. They have money in the bank they have a guardian, they could have a good quality of life and they refuse to leave, uh, they refuse to leave the homeless shelter. And we, we can't figure out how to make them leave. It's really as simple yeah, I've, as that. I've, I've got a guardian case right now. We established a guardianship several months ago. Uh, the woman has been at Norma Hare shelter for almost three years now. You know, she's just become part of the landscape there and we don't have any great plan for getting her out of there. Um, well, one thing we do find, and this is more true maybe with the elderly population, but also with the mental health population, uh, 
if somebody is hospitalized at some point, whether it's psychiatric or physical, that generally could be a stepping stone to getting some, you know, some sort of placement made, whether at a nursing home, whether at a group home, because uh, suddenly the guardian is in control of discharge planning and so forth. Okay, Jude. Yeah, yeah, that's true. If somebody is in one facility, it's it's often easier to move them to another facility. It's easier to move somebody from the hospital to a group home than it is from from mom's home to a group home. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, let's talk about money. If you don't, you a lot of times money is really a good. If you can control somebody's money, that really gives you a lot of leverage over them, whether or not you're the guardian. And the fact that you have control over somebody's check may make it easier to get them to comply with what you would like them to do. Can I ask you a question? Sure. And it was about, and it was about the housing part. Yes. Um, if we have if we have somebody in housing, uh -huh. and, and he doesn't have a guardian, and he does need a guardian, um, and we've been documenting his uh, activities in in the house and everything, then. He got probated a couple of times and everything. And they're like you said, they'll release them because they can't hold them. Right. And their family members don't want to be their guardian or anything. As what can we do as how do about that? As a housing provider, we know we need, he needs them. I'm sorry. If we know we need he needs uh, a guardianship. To right. make decisions for him because he cannot make decisions on his own but um the guardian does i mean the the, the family members don't want no part of it uh -huh. us as as housing what can we do about it well you need an applicant that's the problem you need somebody who's willing to serve as guardian and if you don't have a, a family member who's willing to do that your options are are, are really limited okay would you like to talk about that magistrate yeah, we live in a world of supply and demand, and uh, the, the the shortest supply we have is people willing to serve as guardians, okay? There's a huge demand, uh, but we get many, many calls every day, every week about, you know, whether it's from a group home provider, a nursing home, whatever, about needing a guardian, but we need an applicant. We need somebody to step up and, and serve as guardians. Do we have some services at our disposal? The answer is yes. We have two different indigent guardianship services that work with the court, um, but unfortunately they primarily service the geriatric population, the over 60 population in nursing homes. So for a younger um, mental health individual, uh, uh, someone with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, who maybe has been living on the streets for years or from one group home to another, we don't have any agencies available to serve as guardians for those individuals. We re really rely on, on family members to be very honest. And uh, uh, you know, if it's a nursing home, we can direct them to one of the guardianship services, but a uh, group home provider is very difficult unless you can find a family member willing to serve as applicants. Thank you. Now, now, having said that, there there is one instance where you could get a guardian for a, a younger mental health client, and that would be if there was a, a major medical issue that needed to be addressed. Right. So if you have a 25-year-old whose diagnosis is schizophrenia, but they need a major surgery for some reason, in that instance, we can get, get a guardian for them. But that, that's seldom the case with younger people with mental illness, unfortunately, at least the, the calls that we get. Thank you. Okay. Until somebody figures out a way to finance it. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so, um, so you know, if, if your loved one gets Social Security or SSI, you don't have to be a guardian to be appointed the rep payee. If you can provide information to Social Security that your loved one can't manage their money. If you can convince them, they'll appoint you the payee and then you'll be responsible for managing their finances. If your loved one gets VA benefits, you can ask the VA to appoint you as a fiduciary. That's a little bit more complicated than working with Social Security, but it can be done. 
And you don't have to be a guardian to deal with either, either Social Security or the VA. And, and both of these financial situations described here, they fall outside the oversight of the court. If an individual receives only a Social Security check, we will appoint guardian of the person. We will not appoint guardian of the estate just to manage Social Security because Social Security has their own payee system and they oversee that themselves. Another alternative, a lot of folks, they want to be the guardian. They want to be able to make medical and mental health decisions. They really don't want to be, be handling the finances. And that's understandable. And there are some payee services. Uh, the one the court works with is called SMILE. That's an acronym, S-M-I-L-E. And uh, um, as guardian, you could always arrange for SMILE to receive the monthly check and see that, you know, that things are paid that need to be paid. And, and you don't have to, yell. they charge a fee, but it, it's a very nominal fee for the service they provide. But we have a number of guardianships where a service actually handles the funds. Uh, there was a, a question popped up about becoming a ward of the state. I'll respond to that real quick. There okay. really is no such thing as that. Um, um, there is a state agency called APSI, Advocacy Protective Services, Inc. They do, uh, service the, uh, uh, the MRDD population, the developmentally disabled individuals. But um, it, it's not unusual for a guardian maybe who's becoming elderly or becoming frustrated to send us a letter of resignation saying, yeah, I'll just let my son become a ward of the state. And I usually have to contact them and explain there really is no such thing. I mean, you're either under guardianship or you're not. And if there's nobody to serve as guardian, often I'll explore with them whether there's another family member who can maybe take over the guardianship because there really is no such thing as being a ward of the state. Okay, Jude. Okay. Okay, so back to should I become my loved one's guardian? Well, Maybe, you know, if less restrictive alternatives haven't been successful, guardianship may be helpful. And if you become somebody's guardian, you know, your loved one's guardian, even if um, you can't get them to move out of the house or you can't take them, uh, convince them to take their medicine, you, you are guaranteed access to their medical records, their psychiatric records. Uh, the provider has to release information to you. So if they do wind up in the hospital, the hospital has to communicate with you and work with you. Um, so it's it's an automatic release of information. And um, th that's that's very helpful. You wanna know what the hospital's doing to your loved one or doing on behalf of your loved one. And if you're the guardian, they have to share that information with you. So at the very least, you are entitled to that information. Um, we're going to talk for a couple of minutes about how do you actually become a guardian. And you start by filing an application. Here's a quick, let me see what's here up on chat. Okay, here's a question. Is there temporary emergency guardianship? Okay, I'll be glad to talk about emergency guardianships. Um, because to be honest, um, back when people used to come in the door more frequently, almost everybody who'd come up to the department and, and want to file for a guardianship, the first words out of their mouth generally is, I need an emergency guardianship, you know? And we would ask some questions to try to understand what the emergency might be. Unfortunately, someone who has had mental illness for, you know, the last 20 years, it can't possibly be an emergency, you know, today. Um, for emergency type situations, where the individual is perhaps having a serious episode or a problematic episode has become a threat to themselves or others. That's what our psychiatric department is for. They're the department who can provide immediate hospitalization and immediate relief. And guardianship is more of the long-term solution uh, to the problem. Um, there is such a thing as emergency guardianship. It's very, sort of an awkward creation, to be honest, because if we do grant an emergency guardianship, it's only valid for 72 hours, okay? So it's really intended to make 
a decision not to manage someone's care over time, it requires that we somehow get service on the individual within that 72 hours. And then we have to have a, hear a full hearing within 72 hours, and then another hearing three weeks later on the guardianship. So it's a very awkward vehicle and to be very honest, about the only thing we do emergency guardianships for is for medical emergencies. Somebody needs an emergency surgery of some sort and we're contacted by a hospital or a family member is sent by a hospital um, um, for, for an emergency medical treatment of some sort. Generally, that's what we do the emergency guardianships for, but not generally for mental health cases. Okay. okay. Jude, any other, any other comments on that on emergency guardianships? I know you've dealt with them over the years. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, they're they're rare. They're rare. They they are awkward. Yep. Okay. Okay. Do so, want, do, you want, do you want me to talk a little bit about the application process? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, we we try to keep our pride. Once you determine that you think your family member or uh, acquaintance or friend or uh, the individual um, would benefit from having a guardian, a medical and mental health decision maker. Um, you know, you need to file an application with the court. Um, all of our forms are on our probate court website. All you have to do is Google Cuyahoga County Probate Court and our website will come up. There's four or five tabs. You click on the forms tab and there's a drop down. You click on guardianship. And our application is form 17.0. Um, they're all numbered. Um, yep, there it is, Matt. And uh, um, the, the forms are PDF forms, so you can fill them in on your computer and then print them, or you can print them out and fill them out by hand. Um, uh, the like I said, the application is form 17.0. It's, it's an application uh, for guardianship of an adult incompetent. That's what the title says on it. Uh, part of the uh, package includes the statement of expert evaluation. That's a four page form that needs to be filled out by a, a, either a medical doctor, a clinical psychologist, and must be filed with the application. Um, we only have one exception to that, um, and, and this is all according to statewide rules, what we call Rule 66. If the individual, let's say you are filing for guardianship of someone who is maybe living on the streets and refusing you know, to have a, an evaluation done, there is an affidavit that you can file in lieu of the, uh, of the medical statement and uh, we will consider that, you know, if, if the individual is flat out refusing uh, to, to be evaluated. Um, the filing fee is $175. There's three ways to file uh, the application. You can physically come into our building on our first floor uh, filing area and they can uh, take care of you there. You can mail it in or you can e-file um, and I'm not going to go into any details about e-filing, but there is a process so you can set up an account with the court and actually e-file it from your computer, make your payment using a credit or debit card. And uh, we have a whole separate e-file department that you could contact, you know, if you're trying to e-file and you're having problems for it. Okay. We try to be as user-friendly as possible. I mean, um, some folks file applications with the assistance of an attorney, um, but if you're reasonably competent with, uh, with the computer and with uh, printing out forms and filling them out, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just names, addresses. Um, there's, a, there's a very important form included called the next of kin form where you have to list the names and addresses of all of the wards next of kin. and um, and because we're obligated by law to send notice to any next of kin of the ward that reside in the state of Ohio, okay? So if you're a son or daughter filing an application, we would send notice to, if there's a spouse, certainly the spouse and any other children of the ward that 
that resides within the state of Rhode Island. Okay. Um, once the application is filed, within two or three days, we assign an investigator to the case and we assign uh, a hearing date. Our hearing dates are four weeks out almost to the day. Um, we, we keep a very rigid schedule. You're never gonna have to wait two or three months for a hearing date. It's, it's, it's exactly four weeks from the week of filing and all of our hearings right now are being conducted via Zoom. Um, not sure if that will change or not, but uh, uh, unless there's some, you know, Thing problematic about the case, like if someone absolutely cannot manage Zoom, we could do an in-person hearing, but our Zoom links include a phone number, so you can just actually call in and participate in the hearing also. You don't need to do it on a computer. Dude, I don't know what your next slide is. Um, okay, well, that that um, follows what, what you just said about the mechanics of, of um, okay. what, what happens once an application is filed. I'll, I'll just talk for a minute about my role here as a court investigator. Mm -hmm. uh, when, once um, the case has been assigned to an investigator, at least seven days before the hearing, the investigator has to meet with the proposed ward. We, we give them the hearing notice, which includes their rights. They have five specific legal rights, which we want them to be aware of to the extent possible. They have the right to be present at the hearing, to participate in the hearing, to contest the application. They have the right to be represented by an attorney. If they can't afford an attorney, if they request one, the court will appoint one to represent them at court's expense. They can have a friend or a family member present at the hearing with them. As I said before, guardianship is based on medical evidence, so we will have medical evidence at the time that the case is filed. They may not agree with that evidence. They have the right to request an independent evaluation. They can provide their own report if they want. If they want an independent evaluation, if they can't afford to pay for an examination, the court will appoint a psychiatrist or a psychologist to conduct an examination and prepare a report for the court and the court will also pay for that. And there is even a provision in Ohio law for them to appeal a guardianship. So if they do get a guardian, they can appeal that decision. They're, they don't have too much time to do it, but they can do it. And if they need an attorney and if they need the transcripts, the court will pay for the attorney and pay for those transcripts. So that is what we, um, the court investigator will share with, with the uh, prospective ward at least seven days before the hearing. Then after that, the investigator will write a report. I have to prepare a report. I note that the person was served. Do I provide an opinion as to whether or not guardianship is necessary? Do I think that the applicant is suitable? Um, guardianships are for, are, are for an indefinite period of time. Our court requires uh, ongoing documentation every two years because we want to know if the guardianship is still necessary, but we don't really have time-limited guardianships. Theoretically, a guardianship could last for a lifetime. Um, the initial hearing is generally the only time that you will have to appear in court, and now with COVID, the, the only time you would even have a Zoom hearing. Uh, one thing I'd like to, to point out, there, there is a provision in the guardianship application. We, we ask for your address, we communicate with people by mail. We don't ask for email addresses. We need to know where you're living and we also need to know where your loved one is living because we're the superior guardian, so we have to know where our wards are. But we will, if there's a need for a hearing or for a routine filing from me, we're gonna uh, contact you by mail. So we really need to know where you're at. If uh, you move, please let us know about that. Uh, I got a couple of questions here. Yeah, the one about elder. Uh, some, uh, do other counties have probate courts? Yes, they do. Uh, some pro, some smaller counties, the judge will share the, the probate court duties along with the juvenile court duties. Yeah. And it's like a split court almost. Is that accurate, Dave? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ju juvenile often goes with probate. Um, yeah, every county has a probate court. There is no probate court is bigger as busy as ours though. I mean, 
Uh, we do 2,000 guardian, new guardianships every year. That's as many as Franklin, Hamilton, Lucas counties combined. I can't explain why, but we are we have three full-time magistrates, six full-time investigators, you know, do, doing guardianship work. So, uh, and and the 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 four week uh, time between filing and uh, hearing. I mean, again, that's essentially to allow Jude and the other investigators to do what they need to do, to contact the applicant, reach out to family members, visit with the potential ward, write a report. That all happens in this four week time frame. Um, there was a question about providing what? service to somebody in, uh, with dementia at assisted yeah. living. How do, how do we give notice to somebody in assisted living with dementia? That's a great question. And are, I, are we, Jude, I don't know if we're talking about a potential ward or someone, you know, or a family member. Um, I believe that I'm going to address it as talking of, to a potential ward. Yeah, go ahead. And, you do that every day. Yeah, I, I really, we, we just do what we can. Some people are, are just, some people are basically non-responsive. We have served people who are in a coma, in a, in a coma, literally in a coma. They're non-responsive and we stand there and we read the notice and then we leave. And that's to the extent, again, to the extent possible, we want people to be aware of this and we want them to, uh, you know, to claim their rights if they want to do that. Right. But some people are just incapable and, you know, that's, that's the uh, unfortunate reality. That's the best answer. That's the only answer I can give you for that. Okay. Okay. A um, couple of. But what else do you have on your slides? I, I, I will. I, I want to talk a little bit about what happens at a hearing, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you do that now? Okay. I mean, because that's the great mystery. What actually happens at the Zoom hearing? Um, of course, they were all in person up until two years ago, and. And a lot depends on whether the case is, is what we call contested or uncontested. Um, how could a case be contested? Um, if we have multiple applicants, for example, a disagreement between family members over who should. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, you know, or if the, the ward themselves, you know, um, is objecting to the guardianship and perhaps has requested legal counsel and we've appointed an attorney, they want a second evaluation. I will tell you 80 to 90% of the cases are started and completed at the first hearing. But if, if, a, if a ward, for example, does not want a guardian, they have an attorney there, generally the case will be continued for a couple of weeks um, so we can put the case into a, larger time slot where we can take more formal evidence, okay? If the individual requests a, a, an independent evaluation, that's pushing us out about four or five weeks to get the evaluation completed and back to the court. Um, but as long as it's an uncontested case, it generally will get done on the day of the initial hearing. And the hearing kind of becomes more of an exchange between the magistrate and the applicant and any other family members that are there. I, I would review the medical statement. I would review my investigator's report. I would maybe question the applicant um, about, um, I would maybe question the applicant about, uh, about what their case plan would be, how they're going to manage the individual, how they think guardianship is going to assist them. But again, in an emphasis sense, it's, 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 fairly, um, it's fairly informal, okay? Um, if, if someone is objecting to the guardianship, if the ward themselves or some family member, or we have multiple applications, then we schedule a more formal hearing. We still do it via Zoom, but it's conducted more like a court hearing, um, like what you would see on TV, where we swear witnesses in, uh, we encourage people to get legal counsel if they uh, so desire. Um, we, we have witnesses present testimony, they have to answer questions, and then I have to render a decision as to whether guardianship is appropriate and who would be suitable to serve as guardian. Um, 
a question popped up uh, just a minute ago about how do we determine the appropriateness of the app applicant? Um, well, you know, you know, we're looking at, uh, first of all, some of our cases like for the geriatric, the elderly cases, attorneys serve as guardians very often, especially if there's a lot of assets to be managed. And, uh, you know, I mean, the attorneys we work with, uh, there's not a question with regard to suitability. Um, family members, we're looking at what is their relationship with the potential ward? How involved have they been with the potential ward? Um, um, uh, uh, what is, is there any criminal history? Up until COVID, we were able to fingerprint every applicant, um, you know, and, and do a criminal background check. Um, we're just sort of getting back into that. Unfortunately, that's something we had to let go during COVID because nobody was physically coming into the courthouse. But uh, that is something we have reinstituted. Uh, so guardianship applicants do get fingerprinted. Uh, uh, we get a report back from BCI if there is any criminal history. So that's another consideration. Uh, the rest of it is just a feel for whether the... Uh, person understands what their responsibilities are. Uh, uh, magistrates at the court are all fairly experienced and have a pretty good sense in that regard. So I hope I answered that question. Um, go ahead, Jude. Okay, all right. Um, just the, the, one of the questions that Matt had presented to me that when we first started here, um, what's the difference between guardian of person, guardian of a state? Well, if, if you're guardian a person, you're responsible for medical care, psychiatric care, housing, end of life decisions, guardian of a state, you're responsible for managing finances and resources worth $25,000 or more. That's, that's the big difference. If you, if you are a guardian of a state, you have to be bonded. Um, and in many instances, attorneys um, are appointed guardian of a state. We can have split guardianships. We could have a family member be guardian a person and attorney handle the money. Uh, estates are very specific. I don't want to say that they're that they're difficult, but the the accounting and reporting is very precise, and it's easy to do something wrong, and it's it's just not worth it for somebody who, not not that they don't know what they're doing, but just just the uh, mechanics of it all. It, it's really time consuming. And it's tedious. If there's a guardian of the estate, if it's not an attorney, certainly the guardian of the estate should have, you know, an attorney working with them to make sure all the forms get filed properly and so forth. And uh, and bonding is an issue. You need to have a good financial background to be able to get a bond. And bonding companies often require an individual uh, to have an attorney before they'll even uh, agree to provide a bond. But I said most guardianships can be managed without a guardian of the estate, um, um, you know, through being a social security payee and other methods like that. And don't, I don't want to misunderstand, the same person can serve as guardian of person and of the state if an estate guardianship is necessary. And um, an, an out of state resident can serve as a guardian of person of an Ohio resident. So if you live in Pennsylvania and your loved one lives in Cleveland, you can apply to become their guardian of person. That's fine. We have um, guardians who live in California and they do a good job of taking care of their loved ones here in Ohio. So Ohio law does permit that, but that's for guardian of person only. That's I, correct. I wanna, I'm sorry. A state resident cannot serve as guardian of the estate. Right. Okay, we got a question here. Do you have any examples of how a guardian has functioned in a situation where the ward needed hospitalization of medication, hospitalization or medication? Well, that's, there's no one real good answer to that, unfortunately. Again, if, if the ward needs hospitalization, depending on, on what's going on, do they, if they need hospitalization for a medical issue as opposed to psychiatric decompensation that's one thing if it's psychiatric decompensation we can um you know issue a probate order an order of detention we did just have a, a situation this week where somebody's uh, a woman with chronic mental illness was based on what was reported to us she was literally starving herself to death she had a history of 
of an eating disorder. And, and even though there was no like visible psychosis per se, the fact that she wasn't eating, she was losing weight, she was sickly, that coupled with the, her history of mental illness was enough for us to issue an order of detention and send her to the hospital. Uh, so if you're talking about hospitalization, a psychiatric hospitalization, that's you know a little bit different than a medical hospitalization. If, if somebody needed a surgery and, and they weren't, they were refusing to go to the hospital for a medical procedure and they have a mental illness in addition to this medical issue, it would be difficult for the court to issue an order of detention to send somebody to the hospital under that circumstance. For a psychiatric hospitalization, again, we can issue an order of detention and have them taken to the hospital. Once they're there, you as guardian can sign the voluntary paperwork and then um, they will remain there as long as the doctor thinks it's necessary. That's another thing that should be kept in mind. Discharge is, is it's a medical decision. It's not a legal decision. So if, if the doc says that it's time for, you know, that your loved one has been in the hospital on a psych unit for two weeks and the doc says it's discharge time, you can advocate for them to stay maybe a little bit longer, but you can't make the hospital keep them there if the doctor says that it's time for them to go. Uh, I, I hope that answered your question. Here's another one. If an adult with autism tries to travel out of state on his own, does the guardian have any authority to bring them back home? Yeah, yeah, you do. It's convincing wherever they land that to, to assist. Yeah, to, to acknowledge your authority, basically. We've yeah. had people who, who have gone out of state, they wind up in a hospital, you know, a psych hospital in Indiana or Illinois, and we have to contact that hospital, provide proof of guardianship, and make arrangements for them to discharge, to safely discharge that person and bring them back, bring them back to, um, to Ohio to their home. So as, as long as the, um, the provider or wherever they had acknowledge your, acknowledges your authority as guardian, it should be okay. Yeah, the, the guardianship authority is very broad, okay? And, you know, you have authority to approve almost anything, quite honestly. Um, a lot of these questions revolve more around the, the problem of, of control. You know, how do you, you know, how do you make it happen? You know, in geriatric cases, the chronic problem we have is, is these folks who, insist on remaining in their home, despite the fact that they're, you know, incontinent, falling, not able to take care of themselves. And, you know, what are you gonna do? Like drag them out of their house, kicking and screaming to a nursing home? You, you can't do that, you know? So it's kind of like we as the court can give you the authority, but sometimes, you know, how you're going to accomplish what you need to accomplish becomes very tactical. Sometimes it requires waiting, you know, like I, I've said before, waiting for a hospitalization or something to happen that will allow you to then intercede. Um, right, do you agree with that, Jude? I oh, mean, absolutely. Yeah. Just the logistics are, are, you know, we don't have all the answers with regard to the logistics. Go ahead. Yeah, again, yeah, like the magistrate said, sometimes it's a waiting game. Sometimes we just have to wait for somebody to land in the hospital. And from there, we can get them to the, to the next um, next stop on their journey. But I, I do believe, even though it's an Ohio guardianship, you know, valid within the four corners of Ohio, um, I, I believe most states would recognize your role as a uh, um, uh, guardian. We've certainly had situations where uh, someone with dementia has gotten on the freeway and driven three, four states away where they're, you know, stopped by maybe a highway patrol or something, found to be confused, disoriented. I mean, they will gladly reach out to a guard, an out-of-state guardian to get assistance in getting the person back where they need to be. So um, we've had that. We're, we're out of time. Um, okay. Thank you for this presentation. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm happy to put my email in the chat. 
Um, if there are more questions, um, please um, reach out to me and I can forward them, you know, to um, our helpline that may be able to offer more assistance as well. And maybe, you know, if um, uh, I receive any questions, Jude, I can um, relay them to you and see if you can get back to someone after this meeting. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah. Absolutely. yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did also put the link for the evaluation for this program again in the chat. If you could all open that up now and complete that, it's only take you two minutes. Um, it's anonymous. We appreciate your honest feedback. It's part of what allows us to report back to our funders that we're reaching you and that we're doing what we're saying we're doing and allows us to do programs that are free, open to the public. Um, I see there's also the information about the probate courts website and address and their hours on the screen now. Um, thank you to uh, Magistrate Mills and to Jude for joining us. Um, again, I'll put the link for the survey in the chat once more. Um, I will follow up at the uh, probably tomorrow and send the slides from this presentation, um, as well as the application, you know, which is something that Jude had shared with me and I also included it in the chat um, as well for guardianship, but um, thank you so much for joining us this evening and for your participation everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks Matt. Thanks everybody. Thank everybody you. Have a great night. evening now. Take care. Bye. If you have a question, call the court. We're happy to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Bye -bye. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again, Matt. Good night. Have a good night.